Um, well, let's get started, Kelsey. Um, if you uh, want to turn on your camera and what we can get 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 going. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Sure. Thank you for that reminder, Tom, um, about my camera. But I do want to welcome everyone. I know Tom has already thanked our sponsors, so thanks so much for that. Um, I am Kelsey Funes. Um, I'm a partner at Phelps Dunbar in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, um, and have had the great pleasure of working with our panel to um, put together what I think will be a really great program today. Um, on the panel, we have Karen Lang, um, who is the president and founder of Make Company, a national strategic consulting and legal firm. She's a licensed AAA arbitrator on the construction mega case, commercial and joint venture and M&A panels and serves on the AAA board of directors and the AAA ICDR foundation board. Um, she's an adjunct professor at Northwestern University in its engineering master's program. She's currently the national president of the Girl Scouts of America of the USA. Um, and before uh, forming MATE, she was a shareholder um, well, she was the counsel and secretary of a national mechanical and industrial process piping company and was a senior shareholder and board member of the international law firm Better Price. Um, we also have Mike Mara, who is vice president for the construction division of the AAA and has served with the AAA for more than 19 years. He's currently responsible for expanding the use of AAA construction ADR services in the Mid-Atlantic and New England states. Um, prior to his appointment as vice president, Mr. Mara spent 14 years in the construction and insurance industries in both operations and sales. Um, finally, we have Mike Powell, who is a vice president at the American Arbitration Association and manages the Los, Ange Los Angeles regional office. Um, he's been with the AAA for 27 years and heads up the AAA construction division Western region. Um, he trains commercial arbitrators and aspiring mediators and basic to advanced case management techniques and is a liaison for the AAA's National Construction Dispute Resolution Committee. He's also an active board member and past president of the California Dispute Resolution Council. Um, so what we want to do today is because a lot of folks who um, practice in arbitration and use mediation a lot, um, think about going into that as either part of their practice um, or at, instead of their practice. And what we wanted to do was just talk about how early that process really starts for planning um, and thought processes. And so we hope that this will be really educational and informative for everyone. As, um, as Tom mentioned, we will take questions in the chat. We'll be monitoring the chat. Um, and if we don't get to your questions in the course of the conversation, we'll certainly get back to those at the end. Um, so to get started, um, one of the first things we wanted to look at is um, basically, is there a need um, for more arbitrators and mediators? We'll start with Mike. I don't know wh which Mike you want to talk about that from the AAA perspective. Uh well, I'll, I'll go ahead and take this one. So, yeah, yes, I, to, to answer the question, and is there's definitely always a need for uh, additional arbitrators. Um, we, um, you know, we do look for those. Uh, we'll get into the criteria a little bit later in this presentation, but we do look for those that meet our minimum criteria. Um, we, you know, we currently have between 13 and 1400 arbitrators, uh, at the AAA for construction, uh, about 7,000 total arbitrators, but 13 to 1400 ar arbitrators for construction includes lawyers, industry professionals. Um, and I think that's where we want to stay. That's, that seems to be the, the right number of arbitrators. Um, I think there's, you know, certain areas that we maybe need to expand, um, and maybe in some of the more rural areas, um, certainly diversity it, we'll talk about later on is, is uh, something that's a consideration. But, um, you know, from time to time we hear, well, the, the AAA panel is closed and it's, it's, it's really never been closed. That just may be a function of someone that couldn't get on. Um, but um, we're always looking to um, bring in the next generation of arbitrators. Um, and, and do you have folks that roll off each year? We do. We have those that, that retire, that uh, go off to do different things. Um, you know, there's always a handful of those that go 
in house somewhere and they, they, you know, they can't uh, because of their new position. So there's people that rotate off for various reasons. And then, you know, there's those that, that unfortunately get removed um, if they're not getting selected or there's, uh, you know, some other issue that forces us to, to remove arbitrators. So um, in any given area, we're uh, adding a handful of arbitrators and mediators and rotating off a handful of arbitrators and mediators. Great. So then moving on to the qualifications um, from AAA for mediators, can we talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll start this and uh, then hand it off to, uh, to my colleague. Um, so the, the minimum qualifications for the, for the roster is, uh, it's a minimum essentially of 10 years of professional experience as a um, construction industry professional, a business executive, um, or um, or an advocate, um, and um, you know, I, I say the minimum because um, most of those that we're adding on are not generally around ten years. I think they maybe fifteen to twenty years, really dependent on on where they're located and the and the need in that particular area. Um, I think if you look at some of the big markets, uh, Philadelphia, New York, LA, um, those areas, um, you know, we're probably looking at uh, arbitrators that, um, you know, they, they've had some significant experience, 15, 20 years or more. Um, we do say for, for attorneys that at least 50% of their practice should be in the construction area. And, and again, that, that's um, considering if you, if you get someone from a more rural area, their practice is not likely going to be 100% uh, construction. So um, as we see in the, in the course in the metro areas where you have uh, a number of lawyers whose practice is 100% or close to 100% construction. Uh, Mike Powell, anything to add to that? Uh, no, I would, I would just point out that, you know, uh, the vice presidents are the sort of the gatekeepers to the panels. Uh, and when people are thinking about uh, an arbitration provider to affiliate with, uh, that's, that's the place to start. Um, you want to do your research. You want to look at other providers. Uh, and you want to reach out to us, um, my colleague, Mike Mara, myself. Uh, Linda B.A. Uh, in the Southeast, Rod Tobin in the Midwest. Uh, we're a resource uh, for entrance uh, to the panel, and that's what we do. We can have that conversation with you. Maybe it's too early. Uh, maybe it's not. Uh, and, and many times it's not too late to at least start the path uh, or your journey towards serving as an arbitrator or mediator. So, and, and that's what for any of um, lawyers, younger lawyers who might be on the call, I just want to highlight um, what Mike Mara said, that most of the arbitrators are coming on the panels with um, 15 years um, experience or more. And so I'd like to turn it over to Karen for a more practical question. As a lawyer, when did you feel like you were ready to be an arbitrator? Well, Kelsey, I think that's an excellent question, and I really appreciate the fact that um, I know Mike and um, Mara will get to this a little bit later about the diversity of the panel and the like, but I'm very proud that we have uh, two women arbitrators on this call and uh, that uh, I've had the opportunity to work with this whole panel for many, many years. And, and I thought about this question a lot, um, going back to what was in my head when I thought I was ready about this, because that was a lot longer time ago, Kelsey, than it was for you. <laughs> um, and my thought about that is that these are minimum requirements. And the, the key question is, when do you, as a practicing construction attorney, believe that you have significant enough experience? And I don't mean by years, I mean by actual in the trenches, trial experience. Uh, because if you're gonna be an arbitrator, you have to fully have, and to be exceptional at this, which I believe the AAA requires us all to be, 
you have to be members of the trial bar in your federal as well as state jurisdictions. You really, in my view, need to be somebody who has had a significant level of experience such that when you are sitting in an arbitration representing your clients, uh, for me, it was the point at which I felt that I was one step ahead of all the objections. I knew that the rulings, and it was off the top of my head, and I felt very, very comfortable and conversant with presenting, as well as all of the necessary requirement. Even more importantly, I, I think it's a, a change in nature um, that, that's required. And for me, as a trial lawyer, and I think this is true probably for everybody that I've practiced against that is very successful in this area, we're very competitive people. Our temperament is that we hear indeed cases and, mandate, and believe that we are advocating very zealously for our clients. To be a successful neutral, one has to be mature enough to have the patience to be able to listen to the arguments and go through what's necessary to be very successful and to allow counsel to represent their clients and to make decisions at the end of the day. That's something that takes significant, I believe, trial and litigation maturity, as well as years of practicing experience. So for me, it was much more than saying, I mean, I started out very, very quickly um, in terms of the construction trials because the first firm I was at didn't have anybody else that was in construction. So I had to ask for an extension of the first case they wanted me to try until I was actually sworn into the bar. Um, so I got a two week extension until I could swear in for my first trial uh, and started construction trials from that day there forth. But it, it wasn't really fair because since I was a, a very junior, um, I think four or five years old, I was going to my dad's plant with him and, and started talking about construction. Uh, but others, you really need to know the subject matter exceptionally well and be able to serve. As a mediator, it's a little bit different, Kelsey. And my view of that is that you have to have significant experience in indeed being able to not only have been the person who advocated the case, but was in mediations and have beyond pretrial experience. Uh, significant experience being actually the lead in those matters. So it's a little different for both, but the neutrality and being someone who can actually do all of those things was what the key was for me. So you know, just to, to piggyback on, on what Karen's saying, um, you know, we use the number of years as the guidance, but I think Karen hit upon the things that, that we look at. Um, you know, I can think of an example of uh, someone that I approached to, to join our roster. Um, and uh, I remember clearly his response was, am I old enough? And um, I, I think he was around 40 or so, but he was with a firm that did nothing but construction. Um, he had uh, you know number of cases where he served as lead counsel. Um, he was on a program and was reciting rules from the top of his head. So I said, yeah, no, yeah, you're ready. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so it, go, it's, it said it's more than just uh, a number of years. It's uh, the, um, all the things that Karen mentioned. And Kelsey, it's, I mean, we often hear this and the, the refrain is, you know, enough gray hairs. Well, no one's ever going to know how many I have. Um, so that isn't, isn't the base of on which I judge it, but it's the temperament and the judgment and that experience that Mike just mentioned that I think makes the, the, the critical point. And I think that our VPs of the AAA do an exceptional job of being able to cull through that and do the due diligence. And, and they'll tell you if you're ready. Great. And I think you make a great point, um, Mike and Karen. I think for some some folks come to the construction law bar with experience from industry, That's true. and and um and so I think folks who might be on the call who have that in their toolbox should think about that too. Um, okay, so next, moving on, we've we've talked a little bit about the characteristics of the personality to be a successful arbitrator or mediator. Um, does anybody have anything else to add on that before we move on? Um, I just I just want to follow up real quickly uh, because there are uh, some folks who have the um, uh, that come to the AAA, for example, um, with a very successful legal career and think that that entitles them to automatically be included in the panel 
Um, and that's not necessarily the case. And, it, and it's not, sometimes it's not personal, but sometimes it might be um, the, 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 the personality that you bring. If you were um, uh, the type of, uh, of advocate that was um, not, not, you know, not a person that worked well uh, with opposing counsel, um, you might be the, the type of person that did not work well with other arbitrators on our roster. You know, we, when we do our due diligence, we're speaking to other arbitrators uh, and we're speaking to members of the um, ADR community um, about uh, bringing on new people to the roster. And they will tell us this person is never going to get selected because of X, Y, Z. And we have to take that into consideration. Um, another factor is what are you bringing to the table um, you know, 99% of the, of the um, attorneys and industry professionals that come to us um, have a real passion for, for ADR. They have a passion for arbitration or mediation. Um, if you're coming to us, and as I have had um, on several occasions, um, attorneys and retired judges who are only interested in the income they were to receive. How many cases am I going to get and how much money am I going to make? Uh, I'm not really interested in, in the types of cases. I'm not really interested in anything, but um, you know, I need uh, to make a certain uh, income level um, to pay all my bills, uh, that type of thing. If, 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 that's your, if that's your sole motivation for joining the roster, uh, then we, we likely don't have a spot for you. Um, and similarly, uh, we take our training very serious. There's a two-day uh, advanced training requirement uh, for all new arbitrators. Uh, and if you show up to the training program, you haven't reviewed our rules, you haven't participated in the pre-workshop materials, uh, I'm one of the staff trainers. And um, uh, within the past year, there have been at least two or three uh, participants uh, in our training program that did not pass. Um, and so just because you have been invited by a vice president um, to the roster, that's the beginning of your journey. It's not the end of the journey. Uh, that's just the start. There's the two-day training and continuing education and training, surveys about your performance when you're serving on cases that we look at to make sure uh, that you're always a proper fit. So it's an ongoing process. It's not just a get on the roster and, and then um, you're tenured for life. And Kelsey, just to add a point to this, because I think the slide is right, because it's not just what you have to do to be an arbitrator or mediator, it, to be a successful one. Um, embedded in that is not only being selected, but doing the job right. And, and as Michael mentioned, I, I mean, the concern that I have is that some folks approach this as uh, the gig that they're going to be able to have to sort of take it down a notch and, and it's going to be, you know, some different drive than it was when you were a trial lawyer. And it, it, I would argue it's exactly the contraposition. In some respects, it's even more challenging to be an exceptional arbitrator because you, if you're a single panel arbitrator or if you're the lead in a panel of three and under, you know, the complex rules and, you know, the streamlining procedures, et cetera, you may have more work than you're used to. If you have a bevy of associates that did all of your trial prep or, or you had you know 10 different people doing the briefs and the work for you because you're the arbitrator and, and to do it right, that can be a significant amount of work and you have to be prepared to really engage as necessary. So I think it's all those characteristics that Michael mentioned. The training gives you a good starting point, but you truly have to take this on with the vigor that's necessary, I believe, to be successful. Yeah, and I, I I agree with that too. And um, you know, to to be fair, I don't I don't want it to to sound like we're we're trying to talk people out of pursuing this. Oh, That's no. not what we're here to do, but we do want to set the the reality of of what is. Um, you know, the first thing I tell uh, any potential arbitrator is uh, don't quit your day job. You know, we we talked about those that do this in addition to their practice or as a as a, a, you know, it complements their practice and, you know, a good reason to do it is that it does complement your practice. It, uh, there, there's no better experience in being on the other side of the table one week and then, uh, and then sitting as an arbitrator uh, and vice versa. So, um, you know, there are those that have 
turned it into a full-time thing. And, you know, some of them, maybe it's the only thing they're doing, not necessarily 40 hours a week. Um, but um, it takes time to get there and, and not all get there. For the majority of our panel on the construction side, um, it's, it's something that just complements their practice. And I did see, I did see a question from, from Danielle about, uh, do you have to be um, in the trial bar? And the answer to that is no. Um, we have uh, transactional lawyers, we have in-house lawyers, everyone brings a different experience. We have architects, engineers, contractors. So we really, we try to, to mirror the industry because dependent on the case, people have different requirements. So, um, so it isn't necessarily that you have to, to be a member of the trial bar or, or be an advocate. And, and let's just talk briefly about, and we've sort of touched on this, but um, from the AAA's perspective and even from Karen's perspective, what is it um, that you see that uh, that you know makes some makes one arbitrator maybe be selected um, more often than others? What do you think that advocates and clients and parties look for? Want to take that, Mike? Sure. So it's it's an interesting question. I've actually been. Um, I was at a law firm and uh, one of the attorneys invited me into the room where they were selecting arbitrators um, and they had them all tacked up, you know, on the wall. And he said, this is, this is our process. Uh, and I got to tell you, you know, uh, from a behind the scenes uh, look uh, at how the process works to the actual law firm and seeing the selection process, it was like night and day. They were looking at things that I had never considered. Um, and, it, and it's not, you know, everyone has the experience. Um, but what they're looking at, and I would say this, I, have to, I wanna be real careful here. What they're looking at, and this goes across the board, is predictability. They have a case, they know what that case is, they know what the outcome should be, and so when they're looking at panelists on the red, when they're looking at the resumes, they're, they're not so much worried about what's contained on the resume, but who that person is. And is this the type of person who's going to see this type of dispute this way? So that's like sort of like one of the threshold issues. So if, if, if you are a fair arbitrator and you have a track record of being fair, uh, calling it like you see it, um, you may have even ruled against that attorney on previous matters. But if they know that you are the type of person that calls it like it is, then you, your, you, you know, you, your notches go up um, in the ratings. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the things that, uh, that people don't realize when they, they sometimes talk about in a negative way, um, the number of, you know, uh, or the repeat users or the number of arbitrations that an arbitrator may have served on is a negative thing. Uh, conflict checks, he knows, uh, he or she knows everyone. In our industry, that's a very positive thing um, because if you're not known, uh, you're rarely to get selected. And part of being known is again, what I'm talking about is that predictability factor. This person is going to call it like they see it. And that goes a long way in uh, making it to the top you know, two or three uh, in the first three um, on either side of the list uh, ratings uh, every single time. And I know we've talked a lot about reputation and, um, and how that plays into um, sort of being known in the industry or known by the, um, by the lawyers or the parties. Um, I think that goes to the predictability factor that Mike uh, Powell was just discussing. Um, I guess, Karen or Mike Mara, do you guys have any thoughts on sort of how to build your reputation to, to get to a place where you could be successful as an arbitrator or a mediator in construction? Yes, I'll start and then I'll turn it over to Mike. Uh, I think that this is the ultimate in forum shopping, right? I mean, if you're representing a client, and you have the opportunity to be able to look at a list from the AAA um, if your you know, arbitration agreement that you're looking at doesn't specify you know, that there's going to be party 
uh, selected arbitrators or the like. Um, so if you're looking through the list that's presented, you want not only predictability, but you want to understand that the person that you're going to select has the temperament, the ethics, the fairness, all of the things that you'd want. And it, it's a little bit different between a selection for a neutral that's going to serve as an arbitrator than one as a mediator. And I'll, I'll just make that distinction in a second. But, but the point is to go through Indeed to be able to analyze that. If the person is not someone who shows good judgment, and one of those things is that before for any client that we will select a neutral, um, I'll recommend that they do a social media search and be able to see what that neutral posts. And if there are issues that show any kind of lack of judgment or concerns that um, the client would be worried about. All of those things, the social media presence and um, ethical issues, any concerns about prior decisions or, you know, questions and sanctions and those sorts of things that you can easily see in addition to just um, if someone has been a, a former judge or, or an administrative advocate or otherwise. Uh, I think all of that is important, and that's by reputation in the construction industry. Many of us know each other, and it's a very welcoming bar, which is a great thing, but it's also one that if you uh, can build 20 years of building your reputation in seconds, you can ruin it. Uh, so you have to be very, very mindful about that. Um, for a mediator, it's somebody that can be and has been in the trenches and can settle a case. Uh, and it's somebody who continues to be uh, trained and educated about things from game theory to the most recent psychological ways of enterprise risk and how clients are facing it. All of those things, you need someone who is a continued learner in these areas because it, be, it, it, it changes dramatically over time. And that's important when you're parsing them. Uh, just to the, the questions on, the, on this slide, it, it's something that you need to start and should if you're interested in this area, early on in your career, uh, start tracking those cases in which you are uh, engaged in a mediation or otherwise, and get involved and engaged. Uh, it's an opportunity to be able to, and I think to be well known, it, it takes a lot of work, but the ABA has numerous opportunities through the Construction Forum or the um, Construction Litigation Committee to be involved. We're always looking for people to serve that way and, and junior lawyers have an opportunity to do so. Uh, you know, the um, various industry uh, related activities such as the Construction Super Conference, all of those are ways to not only meet and network with other lawyers, but to learn. And I suggest that you try to avail yourself of as many of those as you have time and your firm will support. Mike, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I you know I think it I think you you said all the right things there, Karen. Uh, you know, reputation is key, and and being known in the industry, right? Being involved in the forum, and and if you think about it, right? If you're if you're looking to be an arbitrator, though the people that attend the forum, the super conference, they're the people picking arbitrators. So you know, get involved. Get you know, be known. Local bar associations. Um, you know, we occasionally get uh, someone that contacts us and says, well, I've been practicing in construction for 30 years and, and I've never heard of them. And, and it's like, well, where have you been practicing? Right. So I don't don't see you involved in anything. I don't see you on cases. I don't see you um, at bar association meetings. Where where are you? So um, I think it's important to be visible. Um, and um, and then also to have a reputation of being of being fair, being fair-minded, even even as an advocate. You um, know, I can I can think of an arbitrator um, some years ago that uh, asked, "Well, I'm not getting picked. You know, well, why why am I not getting picked?" And uh, and then and you start thinking about it. By the third time, you you see him somewhere, and they ask, "It's like, well, every time I've met you in the past, you know, past two years, you've told me about." you know, whose butt you kicked in a, in an arbitration or a litigation. And, um, you know, he had, he had the reputation of being a, a tough litigator. Um, and so, you know, maybe that wasn't as, you know, well suited to sit as an arbitrator, um, versus someone who, you know, comes across as calling it the way they say it. Well, Kelsey, there is a question that yeah. uh, online with this, um, you know, one of the things great, that's great about going to the forum um, is that Mike and Mike, you know, and their colleagues, 
uh, attend and, and yeah. have a booth. And it's great to, to go and get to know them and talk to them and have one-on-one -on -one conversation. So I, I, you know, I highly recommend that you do that at the meetings um, because they're very receptive uh, to having those conversations and, and good people. But the question is from Joseph Strauss, um, you know, and you've already talked about the most important factors and application to becoming a AAA arbitrator, but what about somebody that's not an attorney? We haven't talked too much about that. And we have quite a few members from uh, a National Association of Women in Construction um, that are on this. And I'm curious to see what, you're, what you look for for non-attorney um, uh, applicants. Let me address that real quick, Tom. Um, again, the, before you get to the application stage, um, I would recommend uh, on the back of our rules booklet, it's on our website, the Construction Industry Arbitration Rules and Mediation Procedures, uh, there's a, a listing of all the states and which vice president represents um, those particular states. You want to get in touch with the with the vice president that um, uh, that is in your area, and and start the dialogue. Have a conversation about um, you know exactly that. I'm thinking about applying. What would what would make a strong um, uh, application? What are you looking for? Do you have a need? Uh, we may uncover things in that conversation that you would never have put on your application. Um, once we have your uh, that conversation and your application, we're still, you know, showing that to other people in the association and, and maybe even externally, um, because we rely on our users to really give us feedback on what uh, what's missing on our panel. Um, and they may tell us, um, and I've had this before, I've had, um, you know, bar associations tell us, that they want uh, more industry professionals to round out their three arbitrator panels. Um, and one of the reasons uh, that they like industry professionals is because they bring a, a business uh, aspect to the arbitrations. They bring real hands-on experience, not just a legal mindset, but they're, they're really bringing the business into that arbitration. This is how it goes down in the field. Um, and they and and that's what they want to round out these three arbitrator panels. So I always look very carefully uh, at industry professionals to see what it is that we can pull from their experience that could help us uh, on our roster. And we usually find spaces for them where where it may not have existed before. And it could be that, uh, for example, that might we might see someone in Los Angeles. And we'll ask them, are you willing to travel? Because there is a need for industry professionals in, in San Diego uh, or in the Bay Area or Nevada or Arizona. Are you willing to travel and lend your expertise to those areas? And if they're willing to do that, then they become a much more valuable commodity to us. And there's some good questions coming in on the chat. So um, briefly, uh, I have two questions I want to pose to the panel. The first one is, and I, I think that this is probably easy for the AAA folks to address, is are there opportunities for international issue arbitrators? This is from Leon Peace. Yeah, the, there absolutely is. Um, the International Center for Dispute Resolution, AAA's inter, international arm, um, the the biggest chunk of their cases are construction cases. Um, so there's a lot of international uh, cases that uh, we, we do here. Uh, one of the challenges for ICDR is, um, you know, they're an international organization and um, it's, uh, that only works if you have an international panel, right? So um, we do get a lot of requests from arbitrators uh, domestically to get on the ICDR panel, but they have to, in addition to expertise, they also had to balance with have that with having arbitrators from various uh, countries around around the world. So, so that's a bit of a challenge. Now that said, when when cases are filed and they're looking for specific construction expertise, they will also look at the domestic panel. Um, so if uh, we encourage all our arbitrators, if they have international experience, to make sure it's on their resume. Um, and we have a question uh, for Karen. 
Um, this is from Joseph Katz. Because arbitration is such a different animal than litigation, why is top shelf litigation experience so important? That's a great question, Joseph. I'm, my belief, and this is personal to me, is until one has had enough experience to be able to walk around a courtroom and not know more than where plaintiff or defendant are to sit, uh, that they've been through all the evidentiary issues, that they've seen indeed um, how the differences between, you know, our process as arbitrators where the, you know, evidentiary rules aren't going to apply the same way, but understanding the questioning, the thought process, the presentation of evidence, all of those, you still get into significant issues and that are important. Uh, ones about ESI, et cetera, understanding how to actually prepare for a preliminary hearing and understanding all the potential landmines that can exist in a case from the very beginning of the filing all the way to the issuance of the final award. My view is it's very beneficial to have all of that experience having done it in the trenches. Um, there may be others who, who disagree with me, um, but that's my thought. And, and Kelsey had asked me about what I thought um, initially, what I personally felt. And to me, that's what I think is necessary. I, I'll add my two cents on this too. Um, I, I, so I've been on the panel for a couple of years now, and I'll say that my experience as a litigator and having arbitrated cases as an advocate um, I feel like helps me to discharge my role um, of making sure that the um, that the process is efficient um, and cost effective for the parties. I mean, that's one of the um, one of the cornerstones of arbitration. And so, even when you're building the schedule um, and helping the parties sort of put together what the plan will look like, um, it's helpful to have sort of um, had some experience where you 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 know, um, understand like with ESI and the cost of that and how things got, get bogged down. Um, it, it's been helpful for me to have had that experience to be able to lend that when to the parties when we're having conversations about schedule and discovery and things like that. Um, one more quick question before we move on. Um, we have a question, uh, please repeat how to find the AAA VB, VPs for each region. On our website, uh, www.adr.org, um, from the from the menu screen, you'll you'll see our rules. Um, you you click on the rules menu uh, and go to the construction industry arbitration rules. And on the very back page, um, the back cover of our rules, it lists all of the vice presidents and the specific states that they cover and their contact information. Yeah, we also have a, a one page, um, no, probably a couple pages requirements of, or minimum requirements for the panel that has all the names on it. If, uh, if I could share that with, with Tamara and uh, she could circulate to the attendees, that, that may be helpful too. Great. The, so the next thing I wanted to, um, to I guess, bring up and, and start to chat about a little bit is um, the AAA's commitment to diversity. We have um, a, one of the co-sponsors is um, the Forum's Diversity Committee. And um, you know, I think it would be good to sort of visit about that in the AAA's commitment and ICDR's commitment um, and, and how you guys are pursuing that to, to diversify the panels. Yeah, let me start off with that one. Thank you, Kelsey, a, a very important issue. Um, as mentioned in the opening remarks um, in the um, introductions, I've been with the AAA for 27, well, actually now uh, in the past week, 28 years uh, with AAA. And I can recall from my first year with AAA having conversations about our panel and having conversations about diversity and how the AAA vice president, I wasn't vice president at that time, was going out to law firms and bar associations uh, and, and, and uh, minority bar associations and speaking to those groups about how to get on the AAA roster. Those, you know, 28 years later, we're still committed as ever to diversity. And although it has a lot more attention in the media these days, um, that doesn't negate the fact that it wasn't on our radar um, for the past 30 years. 
But here's the deal. And, and I still go out to uh, minority uh, bar associations. And the one of the issues that I frequently hear is um, we we don't know how uh, there, you know to get on the roster. We didn't know that there's a pathway. We didn't know. So it's an education issue is what I'm hearing. So we're trying to get out uh, and be more transparent about um, how to actually get on the roster by having conversations on uh, on webinars like this. Um, but more importantly, uh, we're we we have a mediation advisory committee, for example. We're, we're looking to our advisors to assist us. We're looking to our arbitrators to assist us. Our arbitrators have in front of them, uh, in their cases, uh, persons of color, um, gender diversity. Um, we're asking them if, 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 you, if you start to see people who are rising stars, for example, that we should be considering to serve as an arbitrator, let us know about it, put them on our radar. If you have people who are in some of the rural areas or some of the areas where we don't get to that often um, that are doing a lot of uh, ADR work um, and um, uh, would like to be considered for the roster, you know, have a conversation with them and have them get in touch with us. Um, that's how it works. Um, and I think our arbitrators who are in the trenches uh, are doing an excellent job of, 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 of getting back into the community and, um, and raising these conversations within their associations and their organizations and bringing us people that we can have these conversations with. And I think it's no different than, than law firms or any other industries. Yes, we struggle in, in the construction, construction industry as a whole to do better. It's not just in, in, in arbitration and mediation, it's law firms, it's, it's, it's companies, it's, it's um, in, in all that we do. So, you know, by working together uh, with uh, the ABA and other groups, we're getting the word out. And I think it's that education that's most important. Every year, our construction industry panel has increased its diversity numbers. And we're now up to 20% uh, diversity, uh, much higher than, than 10 years ago or five years ago. Um, and one of the things that we have done is We've encouraged those people when they come onto the roster uh, to be active. As Mike had said, your reputation is everything. So, um, so we're inviting them to serve on panels with us. We're inviting them to, uh, to go back to their associations and organizations uh, and do these types of programs so that the word continues to spread. Um, and one of the, one of the, um, uh, uh, one of the more recent initiatives that we had was a mentoring project that my colleague Mike Mera is going to talk about. Um, but again, that came out of uh, a need to not just have diverse candidates on the roster, but how do you cultivate that relationship? How do you make sure that they feel included uh, the day after they take their two-day training and they're sitting and waiting on their first case? What happens then? Who's in contact with them at that point? Um, so those, you know, those are some of the ideas uh, that we're celebrating at AAA ICDR with regards to diversity. And um, if there's others on the panel that have any comments. Yeah, I just want to just mention that, um, you know, we view ourselves as a partner to the industry. And um, we do look to other associations, other organizations to, uh, that we can work with to uh, help with uh, increasing our diversity on our panel. Um, some of you may know we uh, have a, a National Construction Dispute Resolution Committee. It's a committee that was formed in, in 1966 when we first became the default in, in AIA documents. So um, the, there's, some, there's some tenure to the, to the organization. Um, Quite frankly, it was the year I was born, so it's been it's been around it's been around a while, um, and um, it's you know it's made up of all the various construction organizations, the AIA, AGC, the engineering groups, the the forum um, is, is is a member of that group, and at every meeting we have this discussion, uh, this reminder of diversity, and making the recommendations. So it's it's 
goes far beyond, um, you know, just attorneys. It's the architect groups, it's the engineering groups, um, it's the, you know, it's the uh, con the construction managers. It's it really it really runs the gamut. So we do look broadly um, to, uh, you know, make sure our panel is diverse. And, and Kelsey, I'll add a different point about this. Yeah. I mean, what I'm very proud of, and, and uh, as you mentioned in my very nice introduction, thank you, um, that on the AAA board, we focus very, very significantly on this point. And that the percentage of women in the AAA roster is higher than the percentage of women in equity law firms across the country. Uh, and we're very proud of that. But it still is the age old problem, right? Having been this as even longer um, than uh, we've heard about the, the rules being in place um, and having done this for a while, you know, I, I remember back, I was the first associate at my firm who had a child and then stayed around and was actually made partner. Um, so doing this for a while and seeing how long firms have been struggling with this issue to be able to give women experience and be able to get them to a place where not only do they feel comfortable enough and, and they raise their hand and they become arbitrators, but then to be able to be selected because they have the experience and the reputation and the gravitas. And we ask them like on the prior slide to do all of the other things. So you're supposed to speak at industry conferences and do all of these other things where you're trying to balance work life. Um, that, that is a significant vertical lift. And I, I think we understand that, but that's why these programs are so important to tell you to start early, to start thinking about this, to start looking at your law firms and see if there's room, uh, particularly in the construction practice for uh, the opportunity to do you to serve on um, the AAA panel. I think Mr. Don asked in, in the questions, if you can do so, if you have to um, stop practicing law, I've never stopped practicing law. I still have active cases and um, work far more. Probably 70% of my practice is, uh, you know, engaged for clients and advocacy as opposed to the remainder uh, in doing uh, AAA uh, work as an arbitrator, as a mediator. So uh, I think it's something that you have to start early and start planning that um, strategically to be able to give yourself the opportunity to be ready. Uh, but the AAA is, is very welcoming and wants to increase those numbers. So. <laughs> Many of us have to do um, a better job of referring and mentoring you um, that are out there and want to join uh, as diverse candidates. And uh, we do that, and I give names all the time to the VP. So many of us should do that. If you haven't already, please consider doing so. And I guess, um, Mike or Mike, from the AAA's perspective, do you guys have a view about sort of um, uh, full-time neutral versus uh, you know, neutral while practicing? I don't think we have any any statistics and it would be hard to, to get those statistics, I guess, because we don't necessarily know what others are, are doing when they're not arbitrating um, unless they're at a law firm and actively practicing and we see them on, on cases as advocates too. But I'm going to say probably 85 to 90% of our panel um, they have a day job, wouldn't you say, Mike, somewhere around that? Right, right. And again, it goes back to uh, doing your research uh, of various ADR providers to find out where you fit best, because there are some providers that do require uh, a full-time status um, with, uh, with ADR. Um, they want you full-time doing arbitration and or mediation work. They don't want you to to have a separate uh, day job, so to speak. They want you concentrating on your ADR work um, and that's not the AAA model. So as you do your research, uh, you, you, you sort of begin to narrow down who you would like to affiliate with that best um, accommodates your, your, uh, your values and lifestyle uh, expectations. Um, yeah, what it, the go ahead, Mike. One of, the, one of the things that we tout is expertise. And um, we think it's important to have arbitrators that are active in the industry. The construction industry in particular changes so quickly. Um, you know, the technology, the, the means and methods, that stuff that just changes all the time. And it's really important to have somebody that is uh, active in the industry and understands what is going on in the industry at the time. 
Um, so switching back for a moment to our diversity discussion, I know Mike Powell touched briefly on the mentorship program. Um, Mike Mara, can you, can you um, I think we have a slide on that. Can you give a little bit more detail about that and sort of how it works? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is uh, something that came up um, at our National Construction Dispute Resolution Committee. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, the, the purpose behind it was initially was designed for diversity uh, in mind to bring diverse people on the panel and, and have them have someone that can then mentor them and so that they're getting selected on cases and um, and then it, it kind of broadened from there. Another area that we're always looking to develop is industry professionals. And um, that's a real hot button with the NCDRC to make sure, because they're all industry groups, they want to make sure that they have uh, people that uh, are focused on, on arbitrators that are focused on their particular needs. So um, so we said, well, well, let's make it broader than that. Why not industry professionals? And then it was, well, why not lawyers? Why not anybody that's newer to the panel that, that wants to uh, uh, work on their career and, and, and be mentored by someone who has uh, been successful as an arbitrator? So that was really the genesis of, of where we uh, decided, why we decided to put the uh, mentorship program in place. And it actually just uh, kicked off earlier this year. Um, and uh, we have, I believe, 22 uh, newly trained arbitrators that have been trained in the past, uh, I think, two years that are actively now participating in it. And, and we try to, um, you know, at the outset, we have a, a mentoring questionnaire. We ask them, um, you know, really what their goals are, their areas of interest, uh, short and long-term goals. Um, we then take that information and use it to, to select mentors that match their, their subject area expertise. Um, and, um, and then we set them, we, we put them together uh, to, um, uh, to, to start their, their mentorship period, which, uh, goes one year. Um, I think that a mentorship can certainly go longer if it's a, you know, it's formally one year, but I think if that relationship develops, they become their go-to um, and sometimes builds a friendship. So um, I, I think it's, it's very effective. Um, but we do encourage that the, uh, the mentees own that relationship, that they uh, reach out to their mentor, that they schedule regular meetings, with them, um, that uh, they communicate what their expectations are early on, and um, and then you know circle back to the to the AAA with you know with any questions. We do uh, we do plan on on uh, periodic check ins uh, to see how it's going, and um, uh, you know we 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 do think it's going to be a, a successful program for building the next generation of arbitrators and mediators. So I, I wanted to bring us back and I actually see a question that just um, came up in the chat that um, I think actually is a nice um, compliment to, to what I wanted us to go back and visit um, on. We've talked a lot about arbitrators and the arbitration panel. And I know that when you guys are looking for mediators for your panel, you're looking for folks that um, have had some mediation experience and I think even some training. Um, our question um, is with application fees, training costs, and training time, there seems to be a significant investment required in the procedure to become a AAA arbitrator or mediator. Can you discuss the out-of-pocket cost and investment of days or time that's required? It would be a great, uh, it would be great to have a concise summary of this cost of cash and time. And I think what we've talked about, and I'd like you to touch on this too, is some, on the mediator side in particular, it seems like you guys have, are expecting them to have already been established or, or have started in some respect before they come to the AAA. So I'm not sure which Mike wants to start with this. Well, Mike, Mike Powell's well, nodding. So why don't I talk? About, why don't I talk about arbitration and then and then Mike Powell, you can talk about mediation. Okay. Um, you know, we we mentioned for arbitration that there's required training, and once you've been accepted to the panel. 
uh, we we invite you to the training. There there is a cost to the training. I think it's seven ninety five. It's a, a two day, uh, hopefully in person going forward training. We did do a few um, that were virtual, um, but there's nothing like the, the in person for these programs and the relationships you make with the other attendees. Um, but there, yeah, there is a there is a cost to the training. Uh, you will likely have to travel for it. We do rotate it around the country, but it's usually in in major cities: New York, L.A., Chicago. Um, you know those types of, of the bigger cities. Um, and um, you know, short of that, that's that's really your initial outlay uh, for the arbitration panel. There is a a once per year panel fee that we charge and it's uh, $150 a year for the first five years and then graduates up to I think a maximum of 550 over uh, by, by year 10. Um, so that is the only uh, cost going forward. Um, we don't share in arbitrators fees. Uh, the arbitrators set their rates um, according to the market, and um, you know, there's no there's no additional sharing of fees there. Yeah, and, yeah. And just to follow up on that, your your first case will cover the cost that uh, of your initial outlay uh, for the training, which I think, and again, I had mentioned earlier, I serve as one of the staff trainers, uh, and Mike, yes, we are going to in person. Uh, training uh, from this point forward. So um, the two-day trainings will be in person. Um, and every comment that we have received was that um, I didn't understand at the beginning how much I would learn because we're not training you how to be an arbitrator. We're training uh, on how to be a AAA arbitrator. Uh, and there's a difference there because we're, we're covering our rules, our policies, our procedures, and we're giving you the background. We're giving you the why this is important to AAA, why this is important to the ADR industry, why this is important. So it's much more than simply just regurgitating our rules and say, no one understand these, get in front of the parties and do your thing. Um, it is, it's much more advanced than that. Um, and we spend a lot of time on the important areas like award writing, which is so critical, um, disclosures, uh, which um, anyone who's been in arbitration understands the importance of, uh, of, of, of initial and continuing uh, disclosures and the problems that can result uh, by failing to disclose. Uh, we also get into handling uh, various types of cases, including uh, when you have um, uh, you know, managing emotional parties, managing, uh, uh, you know, frequent requests for postponements, managing uh, difficult cases, managing multiple party type cases. Um, so it's very thorough and, and, and even seasoned arbitrators that have come from other panels have indicated that, that the training that they received in those two days uh, was far more extensive than they've received in several years of, of, of in-person or, or um, uh, hands-on experience in, in, in their sole practice as an arbitrator. So um, I wouldn't let the cost um, sway you from thinking about uh, coming forward as an arbitrator. Uh, just to speak briefly on mediation, yes, uh, the, the process is a little different. We're looking for established mediators. Mediators are a little bit different um, procedurally. Uh, Quite often, mediators come attached to a case, um, whereas arbitrators, or you're looking for a list of arbitrators. Uh, most people, uh, litigants, have a, a, a list of mediators in their pocket, you know, their top five that they're looking for. Um, so when we are looking for uh, mediators to join the roster, we're really looking for experienced mediators. And again, um, the compensation package for mediators is similar to arbitration. Um, it's a, uh, when you bill for your mediator fee, uh, it's not a blended fee with the AAA administrative fee. We have a separate line item for the AAA administrative fee. So if you're billing at 500 an hour and you bill for five out or for 10 hours, you're gonna get a check for $5,000. Um, there is um, a, a, 
continuing list of webinars. Uh, some are free, some are for uh, are fee based that speak to um, advanced techniques in mediation. Um, the AAA does um, uh, the the initial mediator training as well as advanced mediator techniques. So uh, whether you are looking to um, to start your journey as a mediator and you don't have any mediations, we have training for that that can get you up to speed uh, and highlight for your area where you might be able to uh, accumulate uh, enough mediations to join the mediation roster. So it's a little bit different than the arbitration panel, but certainly there's always a need, especially right now, uh, we're seeing a, um, a historic increase in the number of construction mediations in addition to uh, an increase or uptick, if you will, in our construction arbitrations. So we're at the end of our time. Um, so I want to thank all the participants uh, for giving us an hour of your day. I hope you got something out of our discussion. I want to thank our panelists, uh, Mike Mara, Mike Powell, and Karen Lang. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed uh, preparing and in, in the time with you today. And thank you, Tom Dunn, and for all of our sponsors for helping to put this together, and Tamara from the ABA making it all work. Um, so if anybody has any other questions, you can certainly reach out to me or any of the panelists and we'll be happy to get you an answer. Um, any other closing thoughts? No, just uh, thank you to the, to the forum for including us. Um, and we do look forward to, to hearing uh, from anyone who has any questions and uh, we, uh, we would be glad to answer them. I echo Mike's comments and again want to thank the forum for allowing us this opportunity to once again educate um, the people who are interested uh, in this particular area, uh, arbitration or mediation. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Sure. And I said, um, Mike and Mike, there's a, a question. Um, if you look at the question and the answers, maybe one of you guys can do a written answer. I'm sorry, Tom. Go ahead. No, I was going to say thank you. Great job, everyone. I learned a lot. Sure. Um, Kelsey, I'm not sure we're seeing that question. Oh, no, maybe not. Okay. So if, if folks need to drop off, we're done. Um, but we'll answer this question. It's where do AAA mediators accumulate their experience before joining the panel? Yeah. And again, that's where you want to reach out to the, uh, to the vice presidents because the answer is going to differ depending on what area that you're in. There could be some court programs, there could be some local programs, there could be some AAA programs where we're looking for in particular areas, mediators who are uh, not necessarily on the AAA panel, but to assist us in mediation, mediating large, uh, large caseloads, for example. So again, you would want to reach out to your Regional Vice President, we have the, the uh, listings on the screen that was provided in the chat room or again on the back of our rules booklet um, and have that conversation because we can certainly steer you um, to the right places. All right, well, unless we get any, I don't see any more questions. And so unless anybody has anything else, I'll give it a second here, but I think, um, I think we're done. I hope everybody has a great holiday weekend and, um, and thanks for joining us. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.